Welcome to Front and Center. From the political battlefields to cooperative playing fields. Today is our first show. And uh, I'm a rookie at this and you'll see, see it as we go. But I'm Michael Maxeni. And before I introduce our first guest, Charles Eisenstein, uh, I wanted to have my partner, Steve Berriman, uh, tell us how you first met Charles. Thanks, Michael. And hi, Charles. Uh, I think it goes back to maybe 2009. It was after the Ascent of Humanity book. And I think I met you at Georgia Kelly's Praxis Peace Conference in Sonoma in 2009. And then in 2012, uh, I interviewed you for a series that we called Involuntary Simplicity. It was right after uh, Sacred Economics. So uh, I've been following your work. You've been on our radar since that time. So it's really great to have you on the show. Yeah, great to connect again. Well, I first was introduced to Charles back in 2011 by my co-founder of Rebellious Truths, when one of the first things he gave me when we started working together was a copy of Sacred Economics. And he said, I really would like you to read this. And that uh, what started me following Charles. And then we invited Charles to be a guest and be interviewed for our show for Rebellious Truths for our YouTube. And we went up to San Francisco and spent most of the day with Charles uh, up at the view room uh, above the top of the Marriott there by Marsconi Center. And Charles uh, was interviewed by Chris, my co-founder, for about four hours. And when we got on the airplane to come back to Orange County, the film crew and Chris were so excited uh, talking about what a great interview and all of these amazing concepts that you had brought forth, Charles. And I listened to them the whole way back. And just before we touched down, I looked at them and I said, guys, keep it in the can. And they looked at me, what do you mean? And I said, we're not going to edit this. And they go, what do you mean? This was just this greatest interview. This guy's amazing. Uh, and I said, it's way too far advanced for our audience at this time. We're not even going to edit it. Keep it there. And, uh, at some point, these concepts and the timing will be right. And they were just disappointed as I'll get out the next day. Did I reconsider? I said, nope. But now fast forward, two more books later, 10 years go by. Now the timing is absolutely, in my opinion, correct. And Charles, you, I think, uh, are now at the right time for your message. And I've been telling people ever since I met you that Charles holds a lantern for humanity to navigate towards through the fog. And I truly believe that you help us with that new story. And that is the foundation of our show is the book that you wrote, The More Beautiful World Our Hearts Know Is Possible. Charles, uh, Oh, before I, before I turn it over to you and ask you to respond to that, though, let me just say that Charles has four sons. Uh, he's living with his wife and youngest child in, in Rhode Island. He's an essayist. Uh, he's a speaker. And most importantly, he's a wonderful human being. Uh, and I consider him a great visionary. Charles, tell us about what you see as the more beautiful worlds our heart knows is possible. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you for that uh, introduction. I'd forgotten about that interview. Um, yeah, I wonder yeah. what happened. Like, I, I sometimes I give these long interviews, and then, you know, if it's for a documentary or something, like three minutes get used or five minutes, and I always <laughs> wonder what happens to those things. This one never even got published. <laughs> I'm glad at least one person heard it, though. <laughs> <laughs> there were five of us. <laughs> so yeah, um, and uh, as for a wonderful human being part, I'm not. You know, have you ever seen the bumper sticker, don't meet the author? <laughs> <laughs> Enough said. <laughs> uh, we'll give you the benefit of the doubt there, Charles. Okay. Thanks. That's, that's uh, being yeah. a human being. We were, we all qualify for that one. Yeah. Uh, now, I, I could maybe even segue that, though, to the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible because it is based on a um, different view of human nature than the one that runs our society. And it might even 
provide another lens to look at, oh, who do we consider a wonderful human being and who is just a horrible human being as if that were some innate quality of them rather than a product of their situation, a product of their circumstances. And because I don't know if you've ever had this realization, when you really understand where someone is coming from, then you think, yeah, you know, if I were in their shoes, I might have done what they did. If I were in that subculture, if I had received that trauma, if I had those, those surroundings, those physical limitations, et cetera, et cetera, maybe I would do as they do. So part of the uh, surroundings or the circumstances that we are in, we meaning most human beings on this planet, at least to the extent that they have received a modern education, that they use money, participate in a market economy, et cetera, et cetera. It's a pretty broad we. We are immersed in what I call the story of separation that tells us it's a mythology, basically. It tells us who we are, what's real, how to be a man, how to be a woman, what's important, how to live life, what the purpose of a human being is. Uh, it tells us the nature of change, how change happens. It, it narrates our political reality, our social reality, and even maybe our material reality. And my, my basic premise of all of my work is that this story that has carried civilization for hundreds, if not thousands of years, and intensified in our time is breaking down, leaving us with a crisis of meaning, a crisis of identity, a uncertainty, a panic even, but also a sense of a possibility, a possibility of transcending the age-old circumstances that we've called human, the human condition. And that's why I call it the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible, because that feeling often goes against what the rational mind, which is steeped in the old story, believes to be possible. But the heart knows that, yeah, the world is supposed to be and can be so much more beautiful, authentic, joyful, harmonious, and alive than what we're accustomed to. So that's that's the basic premise of it. Um, and I'll pause there to see if you want to. Yeah. Steve, you want to jump in with a question? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I just I'm very curious as to you, you did the book on uh, The Ascent of Humanity, which I read many years ago, Sacred Economics, which was a very powerful book as well. How did you come to this third uh, book in, in, that, in that trilogy? How did, how did that idea emerge for you and why that phrase, the more beautiful world? I actually, in the dedication line of The Ascent of Humanity, which I must have written in 2006, um, it says, dedicated to the more beautiful world, our hearts tell us mm. is possible. Mm. So that phrase has been with me for a long time. And it 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 carries a um, kind of a poetic resonance that on a maybe sublinguistic level uh, delivers some of the thesis of the book. That's why I chose the, the title. Do you think over this period of time, it's been, uh, quite a, what is it, 10 years perhaps since you wrote that book? Eight, um, or 10, yeah, eight years. Eight since it was published, but yeah, I was, the writing process was nine years ago. Yeah. Uh, is there anything that, uh, that surprised you in, in the feedback that you got on this book that you went, wow, hmm, I didn't think about that. Is there anything that, that came out after the book came out that created the, uh, a sense of, hmm, I, wow, that's, I didn't expect that, or uh, this is new for me, anything like that? Well, I guess a, a book like that, that speaks very deeply to people can trigger all kinds of emotions, uh, positive and negative projections. So I was not prepared for that level of projection. 
not I mean the book was did not actually reach that wide an audience um it, you know maybe over the years it sold 100,000 copies or so uh, not a lot more I don't, I don't think so it's not like you know it's not like I became a celebrity but because of the powerful effect that the book has on people I you know had to get used to people thinking automatically that I'm a wonderful human being <laughs> and therefore, you know, must meet an extremely high standard uh, that, that is in line with the lofty visions that the book describes. And then they're very disappointed when I don't meet that standard sometimes. Or they're like, they're, people could see the thing is when you, when you behold a possibility that is <clears throat> so different from our current reality, it can be also very, very upsetting. It can be challenging because it puts the question to you, well, why am I living not only in this old story, but, but as this old story? Because the stories inhabit us just as we inhabit them. So it's like the same thing that, that youthful idealism triggers in old people like us there's a kind of a hostility. We kind of want to bring them down. So some people react to the book with, with hostility, like, like what kind of crap is this? You know, it's namby-pamby, airy-fairy, new age nonsense and so forth. Uh, even though I kind of anticipated that and I did my best to defuse that kind of dismissal. Um, and this is actually kind of a bad habit of using sometimes like overly academic language, you know, just to say, but but I'm smart, so don't <laughs> dismiss me just because I'm uh, articulating something very idealistic and seemingly unrealistic. Because part of my point is that even our idea of what is realistic or practical depends on a theory of change that is obsolete. So I actually can't say what I am called to say and stay practical, credible, responsible. Uh, Charles, one of the things for, for many people, when we talk about story, can you elaborate on the importance and power of story and how, and how you talk about mythology, your work to change that story? Yeah. Most of what we consider to be real um, is actually a story. Now, I could take this to a metaphysical level and talk about quantum information and, and observation and so forth. But let's, you know, for now, we can limit it to the political, financial, economic, legal dimensions, the social dimensions. So, for example, um, when someone says, okay, let's be realistic here. Very often what they're talking about is money. Money is, if nothing is more, if nothing embodies practicality and realism more than money, I don't know what it is. Yet money is a set of agreements among human beings. Mm -hmm. The same thing with law. It's, it's it, the same thing with property. All of these things exist only in the realm of human agreement. And what brings us into agreement is <clears throat> the way that we organize reality into concepts and a narrative. This is what tells us who we are and what's real. So the power of these stories is it reaches every aspect of us as social beings. Now, this is being this is, is quite well understood among uh, political operatives who are always about, especially these days, like they're always asking anytime some information arises, okay, does it serve our narrative or not? And if it doesn't, regardless of whether it's true, then it needs to be suppressed. Because they, so they, they have this consciousness of the way that story creates reality. And what I'm talking about, I mean, sometimes I do touch on the more uh, superficial political stories. Traditionally, conservatives have been much better storytellers than liberals, 
although I believe that I would like to say that, well, I was going to say that that's changed or maybe reversed in the last five years, but I'm not even sure who's liberal and who's conservative anymore because anyway, that's, I, that's a whole other topic, but just to say that, that mostly what I'm talking about are deeper stories such as what is a self? The old story, the story of separation says that a self is a discrete separate individual in a world of other, in a world that operates by the application of force, a world that is a gigantic melee of forces and masses. And that our progress as human beings is to exert control over a world that is random to impose intelligence onto a world that has none. So once you accept this basic mythology, then very much of our agricultural practices, medical practices, political ideologies, they all make sense. They all draw from that basic paradigm. So if, like the notion of progress is, is a key pillar of this edifice of our civilization. So that's the kind of thing that, that I am overturning or trying to overturn and replace with uh, another story. And then I look at um, how exactly our society is built on that story. For example, how money embodies a story of separation, how it, how it creates a situation, an environment in which we do experience ourselves as separate competing individuals. So it, it so money is one of the ways that a, a ideology, an ideology or a story becomes true in our experience and brings out a certain aspect of human nature that we then take as elemental. You know, we take that as, oh, that's human nature. So we, we, we mistake effect for cause. Uh, I hope that was coherent. <laughs> I, I want to follow up with it. Can you elaborate on the power of intentions? Because to me, story, uh, writing our new story together, which is the subtitle to the show, uh, the importance of our intentions and the power of those intentions. Yeah. See, this is the puzzle. Here we have right now a society full of people with good intentions. I think one of the main errors of perception that we commit in our time is that we ascribe evil intentions to our opponents when they don't actually have evil intentions. They're just acting from a different set of information and experiences. When we ascribe evil intentions to them, then they think we're crazy because they know very well, <laughs> I'm a good person. You know, I'm not trying to enslave humanity. I'm not trying to, to call the population and, and like all these um, uh, stories that we make about the other side. When the other side reads them, they seem ridiculous. So this is the puzzle. How is it that we have now, maybe there are some human beings who have very evil, selfish intentions. I'm not saying there's no such thing as a predator or a psychopath. However, most people, I believe, and this is just my experience of them, are well-intentioned. How is it that the sum total of all of these good intentions is the dystopia that we have been moving toward for my whole lifetime. Why, why does that happen? How is that happening? That's the question. I don't think that good intentions are any guarantee of good, of good results. Yeah, clearly, that, clearly that's true. And I'm just wondering, since you wrote the, uh, the More Beautiful World book, do you, do you see us um, closer to achieving that further away does it seem more abstract or more real or, uh, you know, because I, I wrote a book, uh, you know, Spontaneous Evolution, uh, the posit our positive future and a way to get there from here. 
And, uh, you know, at the time that Bruce Lipton and I wrote that, it was, uh, you know, that really seemed like we, we can do that. And then uh, that was uh, 12 years ago. So now looking back on, on the past eight or 10 or 12 years, um, is there something that you, you didn't know now that you know then? Um, is there something that makes you feel more encouraged or less encouraged? I like that question. It's something I don't know now that I knew then. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's even better. I was so much older than I'm younger than that now. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know, in those days, it looked like we were starting to get it. You know, it looked like um, control-based high-tech medicine was kind of on the way out and people were awakening to the microbiome and to holistic medicine. And there was this massive movement toward uh, alternative therapies uh, and and toward organic agriculture and permaculture and um, restorative justice practices and and like things looked like they were on the right track. Yeah, sure, there were still some dinosaurs in positions of power, but it looked like the mass consciousness was really accelerating in a good direction. And then <clears throat> COVID came along, and wow, everybody defaulted back to quite a narrow orthodoxy. So, and, and you know, at the same time, um, fascistic or totalitarian trends have uh, dramatically intensified. And the control of centralized big tech has uh, intensified. And the whole um, ideology of progress that I described before as an increasing ability to control the world, for example, in the form of tracking, surveilling, labeling, uh, microchipping, everything and everyone, like that seems to be ascending as well. So in a way, it looks like we're moving away from a new story and doubling down on the old story. But I wonder still if this isn't kind of the last gasp of a dying ideology that if, because where, where does, like what is the process by which a human being or a society emerges from an old self, an old story, an old identity into a new one? It inevitably involves a process of breakdown in which your every effort to maintain life as it was the comfortable, familiar life, and to maintain yourself as who you were, finally fails. And you're left in what I call in the book, uh, the space between stories, you're left in the space between stories, mm -hmm. where you just give up on knowing who you are and what's real anymore. And I think that that's happening to a lot of people, even the proliferation of conspiracy theories is evidence of this breakdown, where the the meaning that everybody agreed on, or almost everybody, it was a, a, a general agreement about who we were and what the world was that encompassed most of society for most of my lifetime, that is disintegrating. And so people in their existential panic, they reach for a replacement story of everything. We had a story of everything, like to take us as Americans, for example, you know, there was a whole part of the mythology was, what America was and democracy and freedom and bringing it to the world. And, and yeah, there was racism, but we're working on that. Yeah, poverty, we're working on that better and better upward and onward. Like that whole mythology that, mm. that was most intense maybe in the United States, but it includes pretty much the whole um, industrialized world. Like that, it was robust, but it's breaking down now. Like we were supposed to have perfect health by the impossibly futuristic year of 2020. The common cold was supposed to have been eliminated 20 years ago. I mean, you're, you're, you're my age or older, right? You remember yeah. like science fiction in the 60s and the 70s. Exactly. I mean, come on, we, we were gonna live in paradise. And, and as that vision fails, people get desperate. So they're reaching for these alternative stories of everything, theory of everything. Oh, it's uh, evil Illuminati and their alien overlords who are uh, harvesting psychic energy by 
you know, through human trafficking and et cetera, et cetera. Like, and I'm not saying, okay, when I call something a myth, by the way, I don't mean that as a slander. It doesn't mean that I'm saying it's just a myth. What I'm saying is that it is a myth. And our current ideology, the entire corpus of science, that, that is a myth as well. Does it mean that it's not useful and not in some sense true? No. So anyway, I'm not passing a judgment here on some of these conspiracy theories or alternate mythologies. Obviously they can't all be true because they all contradict each other. Like Steve, do you believe in the flat earth or the hollow earth? <laughs> you know, okay. So well, it's flat on top. We know that. <laughs> <laughs> looks flat to me. But anyway, but what I'm saying is like, like true or false, okay? These alternative stories of everything, they are a symptom of the breakdown in sense and meaning and identity. And they are kind of like a last, last gasp, like, like, like grasping at another straw before the phase of true surrender, of true uncertainty, of, of, of being willing to not know. Mm. And that's the empty space, the space between stories in, into which something truly new can arise. Yeah. We, we know this is a really good segue, Michael, uh, for, for us to look at what, what's recently happened to you. Uh, you, you ventured into, uh, into the domain of current events um, a while back, a month or two ago, and uh, you wrote this, uh, this piece on uh, mob morality and the unvaxxed, and uh, you know, I, could, I could feel the reverberations uh, all the way over on this coast from uh, the way that people responded to that. So tell us a little bit about what prompted you to write that um, and, uh, and sort of the before math and the aftermath of that, uh, of that article and, uh, and post. Yeah, so I, um, all right, so for one thing, I'm half Jewish and I have kind of a lineage of, of um, you know, some of my ancestors escaped pogroms and, and I've always had this heightened sensitivity to mob dynamics, to scapegoating, mm -hmm. to, to this, this social phenomenon that goes back for millennia um, that was described very clearly by the philosopher René Girard, which is essentially you have social tension of some kind, the original social, social tension and the biggest threat to society in archaic times was cycles of vengeance, uh, blood feuds that would rip societies apart before they even really had a chance to get going. And the solution to these, to these boiling tensions in a society was to find a sacrificial victim or a class of victims and unite in violence, murder them and Hey, problem solved, because the the bloodlust and the desire for vengeance, and the desire to set matters right, that was satiated by the killing. So then, these killings became integrated into myths and legends and morals, and basically the logic was that if killing this scapegoat. Uh, brought peace to society, then they must have been responsible for the conflict to begin with. So this pattern is imprinted indelibly into human beings. We are we instinctively respond to social turmoil with this reflex uh, to find the scapegoat, to find the culprit, to find the person responsible. So fascists, totalitarians, um, power hungry demagogues, they can hijack this energy, direct it toward a victim of choice or a victim class of choice and use that to gain power. So I uh, embarked on a series of essays attempting to defuse that by bringing it into greater awareness. And one of the examples that I used in the third part of, the, of this essay series called Mob Morality and the Unvaxxed, I was like, yeah, this, 
th these scapegoating dynamics are being directed at the unvaccinated who are being like one of the classic patterns is that the um, sacrificial subclass is dehumanized and seen as a source of contagion. So that like, even if you associate with them, then you're suspect like in the Salem witch hunts or in the European witch hunts, if you even were associated with a witch, then you would be accused of witchcraft too. And the only way to protect yourself would be to accuse them, to accuse somebody. So when, when the mob takes form, all it needs is a few ringleaders who are, who are pointing at the victims. And then maybe a good portion of the mob agrees with them. It's like, yeah, let's go get them. And, but maybe there's a silent majority that's like, oh boy, I better not raise my voice or I'm gonna get scapegoated too. So you don't even need a majority. Anyway, so I described these uh, mob dynamics that are taking shape um, against the uh, unvaccinated that regardless of the science, I didn't go that much into the science. I'm saying whether or not there is a scientific justification for the ostracism and maybe forced vaccination of these people, what is happening here is not science. To make that argument, I briefly argued that the science is not, at the very least, is not as certain as we are officially told. And that part really got people upset. So, you know, and, and this is like, kind of like a, a, a temperature of our time. I've been writing alternative health stuff. I mean, even in the ascent of humanity, I think I referred to, um, there's a chapter called the war on germs. Mm -hmm. where I, mm -hmm. I, you know, and I, I talk about how the, the pattern of finding a bad guy and going to war against the bad guy infiltrates medicine. And, and the idea that well-being comes through control takes shape in, okay, let's find the thing to kill. Like I've been writing about this for a long time and it never got me canceled and denounced, you know, um, but now the, the um, realm of acceptable unorthodox opinion has, has shrunk to the point where a lot of what I'm saying now is getting me, um, like I got, you know, denounced by my publisher. I got canceled from these events and stuff, accused of being an anti-Semite. Uh, You're only and, half an anti-Semite, obviously. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, it's, um, I don't know what else you want me to say about it. That's the background anyway. Were, were you surprised? I mean, you can see that there was this building, uh, I mean, because you were writing about it. Um, were you surprised at the reactions and how strong those reactions were and how, in, in a certain regard, irrational? I shouldn't have been surprised. It was, a, I, was I was shocked, like on a physical yeah. level, I felt a yeah. certain amount of shock, mm. but also kind of bemusement because the response to the essay was such a perfect illustration of the thesis of the, of the essay because all of a sudden I became unclean and people like, you know, canceled me from events, even if they agreed with the essay, they still didn't want me on the event because my name had become radioactive. Mm. So, you know, that's, that's a perfect illustration of mob dynamics. Michael, you have a question cooking? Yeah, I was, Charles, I wanted to ask you, do you think that the attacks and this polarization is purposeful uh, by, by some. And I know we're going into some touchy territory about that. Yeah. Um, I can put on the lens of conspiracy uh, and say that there's some level in which like I can, I can look at the world that way. This was all planned. The um, events around COVID-19 are perfectly orchestrated to you know, suppress natural and alternative therapies, to make the 
make the vaccine the only solution to lead to vaccine passports, to lead to the totalitarian control of everybody. Like that lens um, illuminates a lot mm -hmm. and it helps predict what the next step is gonna be. And so I can use that lens. Am I sure that that's true? No. There, there, there are certainly things that are hard to explain in any other way, especially if you go down the rabbit hole of the Kennedy assassinations, you know, and 9-11 and all that stuff. However, I don't spend much effort arguing um, for or against that way of seeing things because for me, the question is, okay, even if there are these uh, diabolical conspirators who uh, infest the halls of power or even are pulling the strings, what gives them that power? They don't have like superpowers. They don't have bigger muscles or like what gives them that power? It's the power of in the end, it's because people are agreeing to conform to their plans. So I'm, I'm, I'm much more interested in what make people, what makes people susceptible to the dynamics of the mob, uh, which then get hijacked by uh, totalitarians. What makes people susceptible to propaganda? What keeps us apart from each other? So I, I, I look at, um, for example, um, to take the vaccine issue, I mean, although maybe I shouldn't even say that word because the AI is going to pick it up and suppress your, <laughs> um, you can bleep that out if you want. To take the uh, uh, injectable substance that shall, shall not be named <laughs> as an example, uh, on both sides, actually, yeah. there is a lot of dehumanization of the other side. So the um, vaccine skeptics, <clears throat> the, oops, said the word again, uh, the skeptics and the resistors, they assume sometimes that uh, virologists and medical researchers are just clueless, corrupt, incompetent, you know, they just overlook this obvious thing. And that and maybe there's, I mean, I think that there, there is institutional bias and paradigm protection and so forth, but come on. Like, do you actually talk to a mainstream scientist and really understand the world from her point of view? Not that often. And then on the mainstream side, uh, I was just the other day looking at, at um, on uh, Instagram and TikTok, looking at people's uh, reports, these their self-reports of vaccine damage, oops, I said it again, um, of, of being damaged by, you know what, and, you know, the comments, like, and these seem like really sincere people, and they're describing like being paralyzed from the waist down, you know, and like tremors that last for weeks, and uh, like, like horrifying stories, and, and, and my doctor said it was coincidence, and, you know, and then like the comment sections, you know, like, nut job, a liar, like that hospital room, that's not a hospital room, that's a hotel room that you've decked out to look like a hospital room. You're just trying to get attention. How much money are you making from this? I'm gonna call CPS and take your kids away, like, like, and misogynistic slurs, you know? And like, I'm like, okay, I don't know for sure that this woman is telling the truth. And, and, and like, oh, and like these, screenshots of all of the videos that get removed, you know, violating community guidelines and stuff and false information. And she's like, but this is my story. Okay, I don't know for sure that she's telling the truth. But one thing I know for sure is that if she is telling the truth, none of these name callers would know it. And so take that and write it large. If the other side is right, how would you ever know it when you dehumanize them to begin with? Not to mention all the suppression of information and the 
and on the, all the censorship and all that kind of stuff. If they're telling the truth, if there if were another way to put it on a systemic level, if um, reports of damage are being suppressed, if alternative therapies are being suppressed, even into the medical literature, how would you know that? So this is one of the ways in which our way of seeing each other actually impedes our ability to make sense of the world because we're not actually communicating. It is in fact a Babylonian crisis, a crisis of communication, a crisis of our, of our, of, of word. We're not, that, that's, that's the biggest crisis for humanity, for the world right now. It's not climate change. It's not vaccines, it's not COVID, it's not anything but a, a crisis in communication. All of our problems would be easy to solve if we could become coherent and see each other as fully divinely human. This, that, this goes back to your original, the, the original uh, statement that you made about the, the dehumanization uh, that's, been, that's been going on and uh, the illusion of separation. And perhaps this is like in the apocalyptic times, the veils are being lifted on all of these things that have been invisible until now. And this chaotic mess is what it looks like. Yeah. You know, for, I mean, I've always considered myself um, politically left uh, in a large part because of my my um, care and concern for those who have been left out of the, um, you know, it's not only my care and concern for those who've been left out, but it's also my care and concern for the winners who basically get a booby prize of the wonderful life they're hoping to get through their success. They get a, a, a false substitute for what they really want, which is, you know, to feel fully alive and to belong and to be at home in the world. Anyway, but my concern for the marginalized, for the oppressed, for the, the third world, for ecosystems that are being destroyed, like this has always made me identify as a leftist. And now that same impulse, like let's listen to those who are being shut out. Let's listen to those whose interests and experiences run counter to corporate profit and the, and, and the power of the oligarchy. Let's listen to these people. Now that is um, including the um, people who are, are marginalized by our reigning medical regime. And like, I don't feel like I've changed. You know, I, I all of a sudden now people think I'm a right winger because through a chain of associations that leads to Donald Trump. <laughs> it's, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm now speechless. We, we call that Trump and lumpen, where anything that seems to reflect that point of view gets lumped in with Donald Trump so it can be dismissed. Trump and lumpen. Um, Michael? Well, this is, there's so much, much to go into. That, but one of the things, Charles, I wanted to ask you is, what is the appropriate next evolution of the ways that we collectively make decisions? Because if we're so polarized, and, you, and how do we come into a state of reunion? And how can, how can we do that? What, what, how can we inhibit a new story of reunion and collaboration? Uh, and then how can that lead us into a, a form of governance that will bring in those voices that have been left out? I do not know. <laughs> well, that's a very appropriate answer because one of the things you said about science is that scientific methods should, in, should embolden people's curiosity and yet it's used the opposite. It's used to shut down curiosity. Uh, and it's yeah. flip-flopped. I, I don't know the how. Uh, I can see the possibility. And I 
can describe the, the vision and the story that will generate the how, that will uh, attune us to the right next step. But I'm not the guy with the answers who says, oh, uh, here's the democratic system of the future. It's direct democracy, it's sociocracy, it's this and that, and we'd use this. Here's the plan, guys. I don't have a plan, but I can give it, you know, pieces, I can describe pieces that point to where we're going and that people can recognize that make them come alive. And then what to do becomes clear in whatever arena you're operating in, which could be very local, it could be in the family, it could be political, it could be corporate, you know. Um, so I could talk about that, but but yeah, I don't have like a... No, no that's perfect. I don't want, yeah, you to say, yeah, here's the path. That, but those those markers, those uh, that you could elaborate on. Yeah. So so like so this gets into what I call the story of interbeing. Uh, using a word I, that I'm I'm told is coined by Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, it's used in Buddhism, and it means essentially that being itself is a relational thing. That that we're not just interdependent practically, for example, on the rainforest or on the algae or on the soil, but that they are part of us and we are part of them, which means that, that what happens to the world in some way happens to us. It means that if we visit violence, say, uh, on other countries, that no matter how, how tall a wall we build, or how comprehensive a surveillance system that we have, that the violence is gonna come in anyway into our experience, maybe taking the form of domestic violence or civil violence. That's a principle of interbeing. It says that our own health is inseparable from the health of the world, from the health of other human beings, from the health of the soil, from the health of the biosphere, because we're not separate. That when we understand that principle, then we start to, to see clearly the way out of our current set of crises. So for example, when we see health of the soil as part of our own health, we adopt agricultural practices that rebuild soil. And it's not calculated, oh, and we're gonna be better off this way, but the result is that we're better off. Maybe more micronutrients, come into our diet. Um, maybe the practices that build soil involve having our hands in the soil and make us feel more connected. Like have you heard of garden therapy, for example? So there, there are many ways, or even just aesthetically, like biodiversity comes back. And, and do you know how a human being suffers when they are deprived of the sounds of birds and insects? So these are, these are just, and then not to mention the way that healthy soil um, anchors uh, climate health like, um, and forests. Like a lot of the, uh, this is why I wrote a book on climate change. And one of the arguments is that a lot of what we blame on CO2 induced global warming is actually caused by deforestation and soil destruction and draining of wetlands. Because these are the organs of a living being, Gaia. Earth that we are part of too. So basically, and you can apply it to socially too, what happens to the other is going to happen to me too. And what heals and, and, and serves the other is going to come back to me as well. This is the operating principle, or one of the operating principles that I describe as part of a new story. And then there's maybe two or three others I could go into, but I'll, I'll, I'll pause there. One of the things that I, I really like how you've described it and you talk about that we're the, the, total, the totality of our experiences. And you touched on it earlier when you're saying, if I had the totality of somebody else's experience, I might have done the same thing. And when people reflect on how we're, we are connected and, and, all of these experiences, all these people that have come into our lives, 
many of them have touched us in a way that's changed us. And that's made us who we are. And, and that's where I was kind of going with this uh, idea where I asked you the question about intentions. Yeah, good intentions are the, the road to hell is paved through good intentions. You know, that's one way to do it. But on the other hand, is we put forth the intentions of a more beautiful world that our hearts know is possible. That with love, compassion, uh, beauty, these things, and we, then it helps us make decisions that will move us there. And then our interactions with other people, when we treat them with that love and compassion and, and understanding, helps change them. And that's how we, we change each other. And we can choose a path to a more beautiful world our hearts know as possible, or continue on this path that we've been on for centuries of separation. Uh, versus, as you call it, and I, and I like the way you phrase it, the, the time of reunion, of coming back together, that is where, to me, the solutions will be found, is when the people are willing to come back together. Uh, that's the path that I think that you hold that lantern for, to give us a vision of where we can and should go and want to go. And if we have a strong enough desire to go to a place of beauty and love, that that will help move us there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's about, it is about touching that, that desire. And, and, and the gratitude for having been touched with that possibility. Like, okay, maybe I am a wonderful person. If I am, I'm sorry I ever said that, although I do think that. <laughs> Thank you. If I am, it wasn't because of my hard efforts. Yeah. It was because of how much my grandmother loved me. It was because of all of the love that was poured into me and all of the blessings mm -hmm. that were poured into me that give me knowledge firsthand of what the world could be and that, and, and that have healed me of the traumas that I've also received. Mm -hmm. So we are not alone here. What I call the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible is, is a being. I understand it as a being, this future that reaches into the present with these tendrils that, that awaken recognition of what's possible the tendrils being things like experiences of forgiveness or generosity, you know, kindness, um, healing. And, and you have that experience and there's a, a recognition, a feeling of recognition, a feeling of a promise of home and therefore hope, authentic hope, which is a premonition of a possibility those are precious treasures that not only do we receive by grace without earning them or deserving them, but that we can also pass on to others. Because, you know, you have these, these visions and then part of your mind is like, am I crazy? Did I really see that? Dare I hope, dare I believe? And then someone else says, oh yeah, I saw that too. Let me tell you what my experience was. And that's how we uplift each other. This is another aspect of interbeing that, that our, uh, excuse me, I'm gonna wait for this airplane to pass. Yeah, another, this is another aspect of interbeing that our ascension into a new story is a collective effort and a collective experience. Because, I mean, I don't know about you, but in the last year and a half, I've definitely had times of pretty profound despair. And what brought me out of that? Again, it was not my hard efforts. I was brought out of it. So, Anytime that I feel like condemning somebody for uh, lolling in 
in despair, for wallowing in depression, not doing anything. And what's wrong with you? I'm doing something about it. Why aren't you? Anytime I remember that, uh, anytime I notice myself doing that, being in condemnation, I remember when I was in that state. Was it condemnation that brought me out? Usually not. And so this becomes a very practical question. If we want to serve a more beautiful world, it's not going to be by the kind of psychological force, shaming, that is currently used to manipulate people into doing things that go against their heart. Mm -hmm. It comes from another place. If we are going to talk about the more beautiful world our hearts know as possible, then clearly the heart has to be a, a key guide. And you know, in, and in these uh, in these times of chaos and confusion and despair, we do see a lot of people in despair. We felt it. Um, what are some of the small ways forward that um, that help us build the bridge from there to here or here to there? I think maybe more like there to here. Yeah. Any act of service or devotion is the way forward. Service to another being or devotion to beauty. So it includes like musicians, artists, anybody who does something more beautifully than it needs to be done. In the Judeo-Christian vocabulary, that's called glorifying God, which is not about, you know, singing praises to the Father in heaven. It's through participating in the creation of that which is good. Anytime you do that, <clears throat> even in the tiniest way, irrationally, you'll feel the despair lift a little bit. Adding on to that, I'd ask you to comment. You made it an, an analogy of the Shurs, uh, and I'm sure I mispronounced it, that they're uh, the Indian tribe, uh, and their impact of nonviolence, uh, and that they were willing to die for cause. Can you go back and do, do you recall that story that you gave? Because it was so powerful about how in, to inhibit a new story through, through your... Yeah. That was a that was a story of a Amazonian tribe, the Shuar, I believe, uh, yeah. um, and it's it's a bit of a uh, there's no um, easy segue to that from what I was talking about now, but um, it's an example of of what is possible when you care about something more than yourself, when you're devoted to something, when when you bow into service to a possibility and even your own life is less important than the manifestation of that possibility that's the level of commitment that we are being called upon to that we are being called to, to exercise today and really like what other life is worth living than to care about something beyond yourself it's a paradox to be fully alive you have to care about something more than being than staying alive that's what our times are called for now we're in this transformation are we going to let what i refer to as the hunger game society elites take us down this path uh that was articulated in those books and movies or are we going to take humanity is and take the reins of control out of their hands and put it into the hands of humanity so that we can serve a greater good uh, to me that's the precipice that we're on uh and those feigned the why i like to use that analogy of the hunger game society elites is because they feign this wonderful compassion and love for all of these tributes and those people out in the districts that were nothing more than slaves to serve their, their needs. 
And that's where I see us at, at this precipice. And that's why the story of, of a more beautiful world hopefully will drive the, the desire of people to want to make decisions that will move us towards that rather than allow us to stay on this current path that we're on. Um, and so mm -hmm. get off on my own tangent here, but. <laughs> well, uh, is there anything else, uh, Charles, that's present for you right now that, that belongs in this conversation that you want to, that you want to add in? Yes, one more thing, um, which came to me as I looked at your smiling face, Steve. Um, <laughs> And you know, remember remember some of the work you've done in the past. Uh, it's humor. When all else fails, there's one gateway left to solidarity, uh, and that's humor. Where all of the dramas, all of the stories that you've taken so seriously and that have pitted one person against another, you step back from those and you laugh at it, and you realize that these perspectives that we are wedded to are not the truth. We can stand outside of them. We can stand outside of the roles that we've identified with and the realities that we've identified with and we can laugh together. And in laughing together, we are together. There's something that it's, it's a stepping outside of reality in a way, same as, as a festival. Like a joke is like a mini, mini festival. And I just would like to say that as, you know, to expand the scope of our change making beyond like the serious crusading stuff. Like, you know, I, I, I earlier spoke of including art and music in it. And I would just also like to add humor and to thank the comedians for reminding us of what is and is not real. When I was well, reading, yeah. when I was rereading uh, the book uh, that you wrote, uh, "Hearts Know the More Beautiful World of Hearts Know It's Possible," it came across me when I read it the first time. What eight years or whatever it was published ago, I read it within a month or so after it came out. I didn't dawn on me when you quoted Swami here, and then I'm going to read from you this little passage that you wrote: "We are the same being." looking at the world through different eyes. And these eyes, these vantage points are each unique. As the comedian Swami Beyond Ananda puts it, quote, you are a totally unique being just like everybody else. <laughs> I won't say more about the nature of being more than that. And that's when I read that again, I said, there's, there's my partner Steve here being quoted, you know. Uh, and, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that was a good one. And, and you know, we, we're at a point where because of all the contradictions, paradox is very appropriate, you know, to be able to hold two ideas that seem to be contradictory. And if you do it in a delightful way, you make people laugh, and then their structure uh, dissolves for a moment. You know, when we, we have you know, the mental structure that we, that we think is reality, all automatically just dissolves and we're in our hearts. And there's that unifying space uh, that for that moment heals the uh, dilution of separation. So perhaps uh, that's one of the ways forward. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, and Steve being with his humor and his wit, I hope it helps uh, offset my, that I struggle with is to control my passion, to find the language that others can hear and others can feel. And it's like, there's, Steve brings in this great humor uh, so that's where I enjoy uh, our relationship and our partnership here. So. Yeah. Well, thank you, Charles, for being uh, our first guest. And thank you for being a beacon uh, to help other people navigate. There were a lot of gems in, 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 this, uh, in this conversation that went a lot of different places. Uh, it, you know, and again, it's, it's updating uh, what you've written and your life's work to apply it in this, in this very um, challenging moment. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Michael and Steve. Uh, yeah, appreciate it. And best of luck on, your, uh, on this uh, enterprise. Thank you, Charles. And for those watching, thank you from front and center. We hope you come back and join us again. 
from the political battlefields to the cooperative playing fields. Let us go there together. And with that, thank you again, Charles. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.